Hello. Taylor. And it looks like we have Courtney online as well, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if you want to try to share your screen, Taylor. Okay. Um, I could uh, double check and make sure this is all working. All right. Did I just share it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're good. Uh, no, but hit hit F five in PowerPoint though to make sure because it goes to a different. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that did it. Cool. Some, if you have a dual monitor, what'll happen is it'll send it to the other screen, and then it gets really confusing yeah. to switch them around. Yeah, to switch them around. Yeah. What you can do in PowerPoint is on the um, screen that's there's the presentation screen and then there's the printed presenter screen. There's an option where you can switch screens mm -hmm. and that'll put it on the one that you're sharing through Zoom. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So you're this is um, uh, looking good. I'm recording this as well. So um, uh, it'll be recorded on my machine and then I'll I'll load it up to um, to uh, YouTube later. Sounds so, perfect. Cool. So yeah, we'll just let let people come on in. So mm -hmm. did Dennis come by and correct everything? Yeah, we got it all sorted out. Awesome. That's yep. great. Yeah, he was uh, very upset when he realized that. He was like, ah. So <laughs> luckily, it was. It looked like it was only because he divided the sections into bags, and it looked like only one bag had been on the wrong scale, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Okay, very cool. Yep. And there's a bag, the bag of artifacts that just came in that if you could, it did enter all that stuff as well, like the grid sheets and the hit sheets, because yep. you'll need to data enter the hit sheets as well before you catalog, because, well, you know, you have to get inventory numbers and all that. Yeah. So. Oh, and then also, if you could let Hannah know this too, when you upload stuff to S3, make it public. Okay. I can go back and make it public, but Sometimes, like I tried to look at some of the pictures and it wasn't letting me do it. And I figured out that they hadn't been made public. And it warned you, like it'll say, are you sure you want to make it public? This isn't secure. Just say yes. So okay. it's, that's the whole point of this, of why, of why we're using S3, so. Yep, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm, anything I don't get done today, um, when Hannah does her lunch and learn next week, she's gonna stay inside and finish up too. Okay. Cool. Yeah. That sounds great. So, um, yeah, I need to um, play around with the the 20 meter stuff is on the UTM grid, and the 10 foot stuff is on state plane. Mm -hmm. So I got to figure out. I think I need to upload those differently. I think I'm going to do the 20 meter first, and then hey, Sarah Lee, <laughs> and then do the uh, the 10 foot later. So I think all the 20 meter is up to date. Cool. And I'll, I'll bring those hits in. But then once you get all, if you finish the 10 foot grid sheets, um, when I come in tomorrow, I'll upload those to the Google Drive and then upload those as well. Cause I need to be able to see where everything is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing all the grid sheets first and then going back and doing hit forms. Hit forms, awesome. That sounds great. Yeah. Appreciate it, Taylor. No problem. Awesome to get all this stuff in. Taylor, I'm actually really super excited about this one. Oh my gosh. The topic's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I know me. Fantastic. <laughs> it's uh, oddly relevant to health and <laughs> wellness <laughs> currently, too. <laughs> yeah. Way to stay on topic. That's oh, how did mm -hmm. I know? <laughs> it, it definitely is. And I'm so glad we're recording this because um, my boyfriend, when I was telling him about it, was like, that sounds really interesting. I'm like, I think we'll be able to access it again later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm downloading it to my machine afterwards and I'll put it on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, I, need, awesome. I, need, I never recorded the one from last week on the bunker. Oh, no. And I need to do it again just in the middle of the night and then record it. So I don't know if it would be if I'd use the camera function or just use Zoom and make my own meeting with myself. I don't know, probably just make Zoom, Zoom, do it on Zoom by myself, so. I think you should do Zoom by yourself and have canned applause, everyone. Oh yeah, there you go. 
Oh, there's a number of people that missed it. Maybe I just want to do it one evening. I bet you'd have people show up to it because it's yeah. not like it's not like with information like that that you that you wouldn't hear something you hadn't noticed the first time anyway. For people, well, who probably haven't. there were that. I mean, given how many people are out there, it's not that many people that were able to attend it. And maybe we could experiment with yeah different times. So like do it seven o'clock in the evening and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I love it. You're like I'm always available. <laughs> huh? I love how you're like, I'm always available. That's right. So <laughs> it's fun stuff. So I'm going to go mute myself and grab my noodles. While Yay. I, watch. <laughs> <laughs> I like your new office, early. <laughs> it's her laundry room. It's a, uh, she showed me this morning. It's a porch that oh. was closed in and it just looks really cool. That's the, it's the old exterior of the house right there. Oh, cool. <laughs> Oh yeah, she's showing us now. So <laughs> tour. Yeah, it sounds like uh, Arlington Wi-Fi may be up and running tomorrow. Yeah, that did they send something else? Uh, just that I think it was just an update that the wire or the whatever whatever part they had had come in. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Mike just sent something else on Arlington. Arlington. Um, yeah, he just sent, thank you for the update. Yeah, he sent an update ticket. Yeah. Thursday afternoon to install. Yeah. Hey, Dean. Hey. How, how are you? you? Good to see you. Good to see you. You're back at home today. Okay. Okay. Where, where were you before? No, I'm saying you are back at home today. Oh, yeah. I'm back at home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Last time you were, Ta you were Taylor's on the, you were on the, the deck of the, of the, of the Taylor's lab. Taylor's in the catbird seat. She's in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. I just want to get my notebook. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Is that your dad, Taylor? Yep. Oh, that's <laughs> <great>. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Brown, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I was just checking in. I will mute myself, though. <laughs> <laughs> we will be listening. Sounds good. Taylor, in a couple of minutes, I'll give you, I'll do an introduction for you. Sounds so. good. <laughs> Hi, Taylor. Hello, how are you, Dean? Good. Hanging in there? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hi, Taylor. <laughs> Hi, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> we miss you outside. I know, I miss <laughs> being outside. <laughs> Hi, Taylor. Hi, Chris. You're a person of a great background. Sky. 
<laughs> there's wait, where's Chris? Chris right here. Blue flags. This is Chris. <laughs> oh yeah. He's sitting on my There's head. Chris. Yeah. There he is. Hi Wendy, how are you doing? Good. Good to see you. Hey Dean, how are you? Hi. Good. How are you doing, Chris? I'm Taylor is Hi, Dean. Hi, Wendy. another relative. Good, good. Yep, that's my mom. Oh, that's your mom. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Is Brown. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got someone famous here. Finish this row, Hannah. Wow. <laughs> Wait. Where's the meat? Yeah. Hepsiba. Oh, sorry. I thought it was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> There's Patrick. Hey, Patrick. I'm going to eat now, so I got to turn the video off. All right. <laughs> I, probably, I should probably do that too in a meeting. So good call, Patrick. <clears throat> well, we're going to let a few more people uh, come in. It's about 12.01. And I'll, I'll introduce uh, Taylor. And uh, yeah, excited to have Taylor on to talk about her paper. <laughs> I'm going to, um, after next week, Hannah is giving her paper. I'm pointing at Hannah on the screen here. Um, Hannah will give her paper next week. And then after that, Chris has given his part two on the temple. And somewhere in between and before that, I'll make a new schedule up for the month of, um, well, it's July now, July 1st. Happy July 1st, everybody. But I'll make the schedule up for the rest of July and, and into early August. So, um, but, um, what uh, Taylor uh, Brown is going to be giving um, her paper today. Originally, we were all scheduled to be at the Mid-Atlantic Archaeology Conference that was going to be in um, Ocean City. Uh, it was in mid-March, and of course, that got canceled with everything going on. So uh, um, Taylor and Hannah are giving their papers, uh, Taylor this week and Hannah, uh, Hannah next week. But Taylor's paper is entitled um, Unruly Bodies, Holistic Healing, Balancing the Understanding of Health and Healing Practices of the Enslaved at James Madison's Montpelier. And um, she, Taylor's going to present it pretty much. Would you want to just do it all the way through and then take questions? Would that be easiest for you, Taylor? Um, I have a few spots built in where I'll ask you guys questions. But if um, oh, nice. anything, anything that comes up, um, you can either stop me or wait till the end. Maybe between every slide, I can pause and just check and see what, what people are thinking. Cool, sounds good. So, if I'm, um, I'll look for if anybody has a chat question, I'll shout it out to you as well. So, all right, so I will share my screen. Okay. So uh, I'm Taylor Brown. Uh, last year I was one of the interns and now I am, am an archaeology technician. Um, so I am going to be talking about the well-being and unruly bodies, uh, in air quotes, of the enslaved community here at Montpelier. Uh, so my research really delved into how we can reconstruct the ways the enslaved community took care of their own health and well-being. And I actually followed in the footsteps of an archaeologist named Dr. Lori Wilkie, who did similar work at an emancipation era house that once belonged to a formerly enslaved woman who served as a midwife in Louisiana. So in her research, Wilkie was also working with a pretty small assemblage of artifacts. And in order to 
tease out a lot of information from this relatively small assemblage, she positioned her artifacts as centerpieces in stories about the past. So in the same sense, I'm going to be taking you through a small assemblage of artifacts from the field quarters whose stories we can weave together to create a portrait of the health and healing practices of the enslaved community at Montpelier. And as a note, the reason I've included the idea of unruly bodies in this presentation is that in addition to Wilkie's methodology, I'm also going to be talking about the work of a modern anthropologist named Dr. Kiara Bridges. Uh, Dr. Bridges coined the term unruly bodies in an ethnography focused on how women and their babies are racialized in medicine and modern hospitals. Because in my mind, the power of archaeology comes from how we're able to draw connections between the past and the present. And when you think about it, medicine and health and well-being is all focused on the body, then and now. So when the bodies we're talking about are also racialized bodies, it can really complicate how we talk about health. So um, that's an important thing to remember and a thread I will pick up on in a minute. But first, I have a question for you all. Let me get to my next slide. How do you guys take care of your own health? Anyone can shout it out or you can type it into the chat. Go to the doctor. You go to the doctor. Try to eat well. Yeah, take care of your diet. A lot of people probably have medicine in their medicine cabinets that they take. Um, looks like we have one in the chat. Uh, exercise. So um, a lot of us know that health doesn't just happen at the doctor's office. We take care of our bodies every day in small ways and big ways. So thinking of the things we talked about, how would those practices you engage in show up in the historical record? So think about documents, uh, what your insurance company knows, what your doctor knows, anything else that I'm not mentioning? Today, probably financial records, like ordering lots of uh, um, steel cut oats from uh, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So a lot of uh, what we officially do for our health ends up in paper trails, what we would call the historical record. But how would the practices you engage in show up in the archaeological one? Well, every time I dispose of a, 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 a package of medicine, it goes in the trash. So There you go. So we have... Somebody will be digging it up, but maybe <laughs> at some point. So we have thrown away or... What I do, though, is I, I carefully tear my name off, off, off the bottle before I throw it in. So <laughs> There you go. But I limit the amount. Of, they may not really get much information from me in that regard. Yeah. So we have used medicine bottles. What else would show up on the record? Dental picks. There you go. Uh, the little <laughs> disposable dental picks. <laughs> Toothbrushes. <laughs> Toothbrushes, yep, thinking of that way. So we have really two uh, three pretty different ways that the practices we engage in to take care of ourselves show up in the historical and archaeological record. And we can ask those same questions of the enslaved community at Montpelier, but we have a limited number of resources to look to for answers. So in the historical record, uh, we can turn to these accounting logs. Uh, so they detail the date and price of medical treatments administered to the Madisons and, the, and Montpelier's enslaved population. These logs belong to a man named Dr. Charles Taylor, who served as the physician for the Madisons between 1816 and 1819. But despite the wealth of information they contain, they're really only a one-sided narrative. It's exactly like if we just looked at your doctor's notes, your insurance company's notes, and your financial records to find out what you did for your health and consider everything that would be left out if we didn't turn to the archaeological record to figure out what people were doing every day. So with that in mind, 
we can pick up that thread from before, the one about unruly bodies. So Dr. Bridges outlines that unruly bodies are created wherever bodies are managed according to a general program of medicine without regard to their individual specific specificities. What is ultimately produced is an unruly object that is most competently managed by a trained professional. Moreover, to say that bodies are produced as unruly underscores that there is more at stake than the mere represent representation of bodies. Bodies behave as unruly when they are constantly measured, quantified, weighed, gauged, or otherwise assessed within a technology that speaks in terms of normal and abnormal. Because you see, when Dr. Charles Taylor was practicing medicine at Montpelier, normal was white and abnormal was anyone that wasn't, specifically black enslaved people. So Dr. Taylor was practicing professional medicine in a time when professional medicine was really wrapped up in rationalizing slavery by encoding it into the biology of the bodies of Black people. Doctors were active participants in creating this mythos that the Black, that the bodies of Black people worked differently than white people's, that they made less sense, that they were harder to cure, that they were less than human even that they were unruly and therefore it was okay that they were enslaved. And that early history of racism in medicine still affects patients' health today as Dr. Bridges explored in her uh, modern ethnography. So when we look at the historical record for evidence of the health and healing practices of the enslaved community, we get a really lopsided picture, just like we would if we only looked at your doctor's insurance and medical record financial records. So this picture has a lot of bias and one that really, and, a, and it's a picture that really paints the bodies of the enslaved community as unruly because they didn't fit that narrow template of health that was basically code for white. So how do we balance that picture? One way is turn is to turn to the archaeological record. So I'll pause here if anyone has any questions so far. All right, looks like we're good, so we'll keep moving. Uh, so as we have shifted our research focus from the South Yard to the home farm complex, I chose to study the assemblage recovered from the field quarters. So that's where the main house is, that first arrow, and the field quarters are these three reconstructed cabins over here. Um, so the individuals living at the site likely would have been integral to the day-to-day -day labor of the plantation's agricultural system. And even though there were relatively few artifacts from which we could potentially reconstruct the health and healing practices using Wilkie's methodology that highlights the stories artifacts can tell, we're able to paint a pretty good picture of what day-to-day -day life might have looked like in this community as they were trying to take care of themselves. So I have another question. What artifacts in your home are central to your health and well-being? So we've already talked about medicine bottles, toothbrushes, dental picks, what else? A little daily pill pack where I divide up what I have to take every week, every day. There you go. Exercise machines. Yep, like ellipticals, treadmills. My bed. Your bed, that's right. <laughs> Sleep is a pretty big component of health and healing. The kitchen, in terms of cooking. Yeah. 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 So we've already, I mean, you guys touched on almost everything. We have those pretty obvious ones, toothbrushes, medicine bottles, stuff like that. But we have some of the less obvious ones, what you cook, what you eat, how you exercise. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned that I'll also add is that we can also look for tokens or amulets. So for example, if you've ever been on a cruise and worn a seasickness brace bracelet, that could be considered something that an artifact people use to take care of their health and healing. And so already we've expanded this idea of what archaeologically health and healing looks like. Um, so move on to our next slide. Oh, not yet. <laughs> well, I mentioned all of those today because 
well-being isn't just physical. It can include mental, emotional, and spiritual health as well. And 200 years ago, enslaved individuals had very similar beliefs. So the artifacts we're going to go over today aren't just the obvious ones. So I've broken them down into four categories, and I'm going to take you through each of them. So from the field quarters, we recovered 169 pharmaceutical bottle glass fragments. These are just like the empty pill containers that you throw out once you've used them. So of the fragments, there are 47 identified bottle bases. So we know we have at least 47 unique patent medicine bottles. And one of the only identifiable medicine bottles once contained essence of peppermint. Um, so the liquid inside, peppermint oil combined with alcohol, would have been a common remedy for nausea, stomach aches, bowel pain, headaches, and toothaches. On top of that, essence of peppermint was often used in combination with other medicines to mask less appealing flavors, just like Mary Poppins' spoonful of sugar. So this vial would have been as common in 18th and 19th century medicine cabinets as Tylenol is in ours today. A uh, little history because it's actually pretty well documented. Um, essence of peppermint was first manufactured in England and patented there in 1762. And by the turn of the 18th century, or by the turn of the 19th century, it was being bottled in US, in the US and Europe. Its uniform packaging, this tiny uh, little turquoise bottle, became so familiar and recognizable that even people who were producing counterfeits still stamped the copy of the English government tax mark onto their fake bottles. So that's how recognizable these things were. And what's really cool is this example from the field slave quarters is made of non-leaded glass, which suggests that it was one of these later American made knockoffs and not an original from England. So kind of touching, bringing Wilkie's methodology of storytelling in, we can imagine a man tired from a long day's labor, brewing himself a cup of tea with a drop of essence of peppermint in it to settle his upset stomach. Or another familiar picture, we can imagine a little kid wrinkling his nose at a strange smelling medicine and their grandmother mixing in a little drop of essence of peppermint to make it more appealing. And those are just two stories that help us imagine what the community living at the field quarters might have done to maintain their own health and well-being. And we can get those pretty holistic pictures just from this little bottle glass fragment. Any questions about essence of peppermint? All right, so we'll move on to our next category. Um, Is there? Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, there's like a weird delay uh, out here. Um, is there documentary evidence of creating like um, essence of peppermint uh, like at home and not through purchasing from manufacturers in the documentary record or other <laughs> similar type of uh, medicinal things? Yeah, so really uh, the whole idea of essence of peppermint is mint and there's a lot of oral history um, even from enslaved contexts of people harvesting mint and using it in a similar way and so you had the easily purchasable essence of peppermint, but it could also be made at home as well. And Wilkie also has another interesting paper where she talks about how um, patent medicines start to show up in enslaved contexts. And a lot of people believed, oh, enslaved people were giving up their old ways, buying into new American capitalism and buying the stuff they used to make themselves. But really, if you think about it, the idea that mint settles a stomach ache came first an essence of peppermint came in and kind of manufactured and bottled that quite literally. But they were already drawing from a history where people knew mint made them feel better. And so really, uh, Wilkie talks about in this paper how finding essence of peppermint at enslaved uh, sites can tell us that uh, people were carrying on their own traditions, but in modern ways by buying it from the store instead of making it, making it themselves, which is pretty cool. Cool. Sweet. Yeah. All right, so we'll move to our next section. 
So there were a lot of plant remains recovered from the field quarters and they are in the form of seeds or what we call macro botanicals. And they were recovered and a number of them might have been grown or gathered for their medicinal purposes. Uh, this chart has a whole list um, and the amount of seeds that were recovered and there were a ton. So I'm not gonna list them all, but a handful that are still pretty familiar today it could be rose, sunflower, forget-me-nots, mint, pepper seed, ragweed, dock, pokeweed, strawberry, jimson weed, sorrel, knotweed, cinquefoil, and more. So combined, these plants treat a variety of injuries and ailments that include burns, blisters, inflammation, nosebleeds, cough, sore throat, rheumatism, diarrhea, arthritis pain, chills, fever, bleeding guns, gums, and more. So all of these plants could have been used in a medicinal sense. And what I think is really the coolest part is that extensive evidence, including oral history, tells us that the keepers of this type of knowledge were enslaved women. So these women were knew that these plants could solve these ailments because that information was passed down through generations. Um, so going back to the stories, you can imagine a young woman listening carefully as her aunts teach her how to identify which plants can treat sore throats and which ones can bring down a fever. Or you can imagine a mom pressing dock leaves to a child's skin to soothe a painful blister. And so all of these plants could have been used in some ways to help people manage their health and well-being. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how were these uh these uh macro botanicals stored were they do they keep them in some kind of uh, jars or well did they have to be uh they would have to be protected from moisture i would think yeah i would assume they would have been either harvested and used immediately or stored in some way the way we were able to recover them most often is they turned up the seeds turned up um, and like flotation samples that you guys will take at the lab. And so that's how we would recover them archeologically. And so it doesn't give us a very clear idea of how they would have been stored um, during the time. So, but I would imagine um, they would have been carefully stored, maybe harvested right away for use. All right, we'll move on to our next section. So beyond plants that they might have grown purely for medicinal purposes, as we mentioned before, we can consider the entire diet of the, of the household as integral to maintaining health and well-being. So we know enslaved individuals all over the US supplemented their meager rations with food they grew, raised, hunted, and collected themselves. So imagine how much work goes into maintaining a garden or livestock or hunting for food. And all of these things enslaved individuals would have done on top of the labor already demanded of them by the Madisons. So a complete diet must have been considered pretty important to overall health. From the macrobotanical evidence, we know that plants grown at the field quarters that may have been integral to diet include corn, peppers, peas, beans, cabbage, and potatoes. And beyond crops, uh, the enslaved population raised chickens and other livestock. The presence of multiple iron fish hooks that you can see on the screen tells us that the people who lived there probably fished for themselves as well. Um, and an interesting story from the historical record in 1825 when General Lafayette visited Montpelier, he noted that the enslaved woman Granny Millie had a personal garden and the guests of the Madisons would be sent to visit her and they'd often return with a potato or a fresh egg as a gift, which seems to me like a very strange ritual, but that is a topic for a whole other paper. Um, but we have all this evidence of the enslaved community growing their own gardens, raising their own livestock. And so we can imagine Granny Millie delicately holding a fresh egg in her, in her palm or a young man returning home with a fishing pole and a fresh catch in a basket. And so these stories tell us that people thought diet was as important to them as we do today. And so that's one of the arenas we can look to when we're talking about health and well-being. Um, any questions about diet or food ways? 
I do. Yeah. Well, um, actually, it kind of pertains specifically to the macro botanicals. You had that chart of recovered stuff, and I noticed that yeah. the goose foot seemed pretty extensively, like there was a lot more of that. Would you attribute that to just what, where, where you were looking, what you just happened to come across that, or is there evidence that there would have been more of that for some reason? Yeah, so a lot of um, our macro botanicals really rely on what we were able to recover in the field and also how well those seeds uh, were preserved through history. Mm -hmm. And so the numbers may indicate that they were particularly uh, attracted to goose foot or it just may be that those happened to preserve really well or as we were digging, we hit a large assemblage of them. So it's hard to say exactly uh, what that super high number means. Thanks. Yeah, and, no problem. And one thing to note is that those are all, uh, the only seeds we're covered are charred seeds. So sometimes like you're saying, Taylor, it's stuff that was being used and processed. Other times it could have been what's called seed rain or it just blew in and that, that, that the goose foot just happened to be, you know, going to seed at that time and blew in, but it's hard to say. But given the hearts, it's probably stuff that was used. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Cool. So we'll move on to my last section of artifacts. Um, so one of, as we've mentioned, I was very impressed that everyone came up with uh, dental picks and toothbrushes because that's a huge part of our health, how we take care of our teeth. Um, at the field quarters, fragments of two bone toothbrushes tell us that individuals living there must have also recognized oral hygiene as integral. Um, but it's interesting, toothbrushes as we know them today weren't always what people thought of when it came to brushing their teeth. In most places, uh, teeth cleaning twigs, I have an example put up there, um, were the primary method of oral hygiene and are still popular in a lot of places today. So the toothbrush we found at the field quarters uh, probably were a Chinese invention that Europeans adopted and so already we have this travel of technology and it's crazy to imagine a young woman living at the field quarters buying this new fangled toothbrush and using it for the first time or another very familiar picture a little kid grumbling about having to go brush their teeth after dinner um, so just like today they obviously thought oral hygiene was pretty integral and on to personal adornment. So like our modern crystal necklaces and saint medallions and nausea bracelets, jewelry from the field quarters may have been worn with well-being in mind. In total, 57 glass beads were found and any number of them may have been worn on the body and considered for protection. Um, any questions about glass beads or personal adornment real quick? All right, so I'll move to a story that isn't from the field quarters, but should be pretty recognizable for people, the Carnelian Ring. So at a different slave quarter um, in a kitchen at Montpelier, a Carnelian Ring was found. Carnelian was highly regarded in many areas of West Africa, and this ring almost certainly came to the U.S. on the body of an enslaved individual. So Carnelian is traditionally related to the promotion of healthy organs and blood, and a little fact that I found out, it was commonly used in powder form as an ingredient in ancient Egyptian medicinal drinks. Um, it could also be worn as protection against falling masonry or accidents involving tools. Um, and probably most interesting to me, carnelian is also related to sexuality and fertility. Notably, it was believed to stop excessive menstrual flow or manage cramps. So when we consider that this ring was likely worn by an enslaved woman working in a kitchen, all sorts of interesting questions surrounding menstruation taboos and food processing come to mind. And I mention this artifact, even though it's not from the field quarters, because it's an amazing story and I wanted to share it, but it's also very likely there were other pieces of personal adornment like it across the property that everyone wore, rings or beads or amulets that people wore to promote their well-being. 
So going back to the stories, we can imagine a cook sliding this ring onto her finger before she goes to work, hoping to quiet some of the cramps in the bottom of her stomach. Or we can even imagine a man touching a glass bead uh, hung around his throat for protection before he goes out to build a new barn. So just like today, health and well-being wasn't limited to the physical body. And remembering that as we in study slave communities encourages archaeologists to consider a more holistic look at the artifacts they uncover, whether they're glass beads or toothbrushes or evidence of diet. Um, so that's my four categories of artifacts and now we're going to kind of bring it back into that bigger discussion. Um, so when we try to reconstruct the practices that the enslaved community engaged in to maintain their health and well-being, we have to remember that there are always multiple sides to a story and that those stories are really entrenched with different perspectives, biases, and agendas. So we can look at Dr. Taylor's accounting logs and see one side of the story. But we have to remember that that side is attached to the history of medicalized racism, medicine that was highly invested in painting the bodies of enslaved Black people as unruly to justify slavery. The history of this racist medicine continues to infect to affect the health of black patients in modern hospitals. Now I've included a slide um, with some early examples of medical racism here and would be glad to talk about those if anyone has any questions. But I really uh, want to focus on the numbers that I've included because they really illustrate how the echoes of slavery still exist in modern medicine. Uh, one of the numbers that was the most shocking to me personally is that a black woman is 243% more likely to die from pregnancy or childbirth related issues than a white woman. So we can really see how medicalized racism is still pretty prominent in modern hospitals. So by adding information we find in the archaeological record and oral histories, we can really balance our understanding of well-being at Montpelier and begin to deconstruct this narrow template of what being healthy really means from the moment it started. So including these artifacts and histories serves as a reminder that the people who lived at the field quarters likely didn't consider their own bodies unruly. The stories these artifacts tell paint a picture of the little and big things individuals might have done every day to take care of themselves and their families. And more research could only illuminate more ways in which the enslaved community at Montpelier took care of their own bodies. And this mindset, this balancing mindset, will help us dig up and expose the roots of racism in modern medicine. Uh, so any questions? Hey, Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, all right. Um, when you were looking at bottle glass, was there any evidence of like perfume um, or when you're looking through documentary records from like other contexts outside of Montpelier, evidence of like controlling the human uh, scent um, during the time? Because I know that like people would wear bags like around their necks with like herbs and stuff in them. And I'm just curious like my knowledge of that is from like just early colonial period, but I don't know if there's any evidence, documentary stuff you found in enslaved contexts in like 19th century Virginia. Uh, documentary, as far as I can go, I didn't run across anything, but I wasn't, I was also, wasn't really looking for examples of perfume. Um, as far as the field quarters go, the glass we recovered from there was really fragmented. And so like mm -hmm. I say that the essence of peppermint bottle was really one of the few identifiable ones that really was one of the only identifiable ones. So there definitely could have been, um, perfume bottles that were just by the time we recover them. So broken up that they'd be hard to tell. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How um, do we have any information that indicates how willing members of the enslaved community would have been to discuss their health problems with, with other members of the enslaved community or perhaps even other people? 
Uh, not that I know of. I know there has been uh, research done at Montpelier previously about kind of the avenues the enslaved community had to access healthcare, um, and I believe it was Matt Greer who wrote this paper, and he talked about how um, the community would have had themselves and hit documentation from other plantations across the U.S. talk about how often there were people within the community that others knew to come to for help. Um, a huge part of that is midwives. Um, black enslaved midwives really were the start of prenatal and obstetrics uh, in the U.S. And then beyond their community, just from Dr. Taylor's logs, we know that um, healthcare, it was known that people could either go to Madison to maybe ask to be seen by Dr. Taylor, but I also think a lot of it must have been that Madison decided when to bring Dr. Taylor onto the property. And an interesting thing is when you look closely through the logs, a lot of what Dr. Taylor is treating are um, sexually transmitted diseases. There's a lot of instances of syphilis. Um, so kind of extrapolating from that, if you are a person who own slaves and slaves are considered valuable to you, you'd want to protect their ability to reproduce and create a new generations of slaves of slaves for you. So it's interesting that Madison was mostly treating STDs when he would call in his professional physician for his enslaved community. Yes, especially considering there must have been a whole range of other um, ailments of various kinds yeah. That would have needed treating in addition to that. Yeah. And also what's super interesting looking at Dr. Taylor's logs, there's really no mention of broken bones or injuries of that type, which surely would have happened on a plantation this size. But uh, Dr. Taylor, at least by the logs we have, wasn't called in to treat them. Taylor, can I push a little bit on that? Um, I think you said a lot of Dr. Taylor's visits. I heard it said once that the most common reason to visit for a doctor's care was STDs. Following up on what you say about the importance of um, the property aspect that mm -hmm. I have trouble articulating. Um, uh, so would I be accurate? I've, some, I've said to a number of our guests, probably over a hundred. Um, the most common reason for a doctor to uh, visit an enslaved person was for STDs. Is, is that? Um, I would say at least I, we have about six pages of Dr. Taylor's logs and kind of just a brief read through through them. A lot of them mention uh, syphilis and other um, but a lot of them also are pretty vague about what they're treating. They'll just note that Dr. Taylor came to the property, charged for some sort of treatment, and then left. And so a lot of the noticeable ailments that he specifically named were STD related, but he was definitely here often enough that maybe that wasn't his most like notorious visit, but it's the one that he most clearly noted in his logs. And I would imagine that could be because um, medicine to use to treat syphilis was pretty specific. And so that was, he was noting it in his logs that he dropped off a course of medicine just for that. But I don't know, I wouldn't say it was his most often visit, but he definitely noted when he came to visit to treat for STDs above anything else. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Taylor, in your research, I, I don't, and you might notice, uh, I've just never seen it from Montpelier. Um, in the Caribbean, especially Jamaica, there's a lot of mention, and this is with a, on estates of over 250, 300 slaves of every estate having a hospital, basically like, like a sick house where slaves would go when they were ill and they wanted to be, needed to be excused from labor. Uh, is there any mention of sick houses in Virginia or the U U.S. in general in the research um, you've done? I believe in more southern plantations there's instances where there are like um, isolated sick houses where people are sent. As far as looking at Virginia, I didn't find any and Montpelier definitely didn't have any mention of it. Yeah, and another interesting note that 
sticks out to me is um, of all the records we have at Montpelier, there's really no mention of midwifery practices. And we know people were having babies here, but um, it wasn't really being recorded. We have one instance of uh, two doctors, really terrible names for doctors. I believe they were Dr. Grimes and Dr. Savage, I'm pretty sure. Um, they, um, Sarah knows it. <laughs> but like really horrible doctor's names, but they went and treated an enslaved woman, I believe at a different plantation, um, but she ended up dying in childbirth um, because the baby was breached, I believe, but that's really the only instance connected to Montpelier where we talk about child delivery, which was very strange and definitely a huge gap that maybe as time goes on, we'll get to learn more about. Well, do you think with the number of older slaves that were at Montpelier, especially with younger slaves being sold off in the 1820s, that, that it, there might be um, a number of folks, of individuals who practice, and then that wouldn't be mentioned, it just would happen? Yeah, that definitely could be it. And a lot of times, um, child delivery was kind of um, enslavers really didn't involve themselves. We have records of them kind of being like, well, the community can take care of that for themselves, which is, I mentioned black enslaved midwives really were the start of obstetric care in the United States. There's history of white doctors going to these formerly enslaved women to learn how to deliver babies in the first place. And so we have this really whole network of women who created a field of medicine that we don't know that much about, especially as they were related to Montpelier. I have well, questions. Oh, yeah. Did the Madisons also have a medicinal herb garden? Is there any indication of that? And also, among the enslaved people, is there an indication that there was a particular enslaved person who was sort of the medical expert that people who people would depend on or was it sort of every family for themselves um so i'll take the first question first i have no idea if the madisons had their own herb garden um i could check and get back to you on that because we have had an intern in the past do a study on gardens but that was also mainly focused on the enslaved community so i'm actually not sure if the madisons relied on medicinal herbs um, and secondly again we don't have a lot of documentary record of the one person who may have been considered the doctor or physician among the, among the enslaved community, um, but evidence from other plantations suggests that there might have been. So even though we don't have record of that at Montpelier, I wouldn't be surprised if through generations there was maybe one person um, who was considered the expert in these areas. And notably, it most likely would have likely been a woman as well. So that's a super interesting story that we don't know yet and we'll have to keep digging to find out. Um, yeah, or, thank, oh yeah. I was just gonna say thank you. This was a wonderful presentation and um, I really appreciated both, really appreciated you tying this to the you know, making the connection the past to present and 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 the racism that's built into the medical profession and um, and stuff like that. And I, <clears throat> I was actually reading last night a book um, called "These Truths: The History of the United States," and completely coincidentally, what I it talked about um, sickness and illness as Europeans were in the 1500s coming over to the United or coming over to the new world and and how they were in fact justifying the um, illnesses that were happening to the indigenous people here as actually being tied to as justifying their arrival right that this is in fact God telling them that they are here for the right reasons because God is clearing the path essentially for their for their conquest um, and I just as you were talking at the beginning about how um, how there is this 
necessity to try to figure out how black bodies are different than white bodies and that they're inferior. I think it, it fits into a, this even longer tradition of manifest destiny, of white supremacy, of, of all of these things that are really making that juxtaposition happen. And I thought that was really, um, anyway, just as literally a thing I read last night, yeah. <laughs> completely randomly, um, that, that uh, I, I thought gives an even, an even deeper um, connection uh, time-wise to, to what you're talking about. So um, anyway, thank you for, for both tying this, bringing, for me making the tie for what I was reading last night to our moment at Montpelier and then all the way up into the present. I, you did a really great job of, of making all these connections. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have one slide left talking about thanks for coming and to plug our live dashboard of our STP survey. Um, it's super cool. Even my parents who live in different states can check it out and figure out what we're doing day to day. Um, and hopefully in the future, I can be around to check out the health and healing practices we can uncover at the Overseer's site. <laughs> Well, Taylor, like Terry said, thank you so much for your presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. I loved how you brought in questions that make it relevant to everybody. You did a, did a wonderful, wonderful job. So <laughs> it made me learn new things that I hadn't thought about and also uh, inspired me to do my presentations differently as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. No problem. Um, my email, I believe, is up on the website, so up on the digital doorway. So if anyone comes up with questions that they want to ask later, definitely send them my way and I will do my best to answer them. And I've recorded this as well. I'll be putting this on YouTube and we'll put it onto the global doc. Or actually, Sarah will put it on the global doc. I'll, I'll share it with you, Sarah. So. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Taylor, I am in awe of how you were able to condense so much. <laughs> and even though you condensed it, it's still very meaty. There's a lot of information and I've got a lot of reading to do now. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Taylor. Bye, thanks guys. Everybody. Thanks for logging in. Bye.